I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and now uh, we're delighted uh, to join as the Atlantic Council as content partner in this very successful eighth uh, Delphi Economic Forum. Uh, we're gonna uh, pick up where the previous panel left off and uh, talk about the wider geostrategic implications of the war in Ukraine, focusing, I should note, in Europe and its uh, the wider region. So I'm delighted to be joined by uh, uh, colleagues from the Atlantic Council and LMF, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, Mr. and I should start with uh, him, uh, Mr. Thanos Dokos, who's the National Security Advisor of the Greek Prime Minister. Also with us uh, is my colleague uh, Anna Wieslander, who's the Director of Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council. Of course, uh, uh, Ambassador Jonathan Cohen, once an ambassador, always an ambassador. <laughs> it, uh, he's uh, a distinguished fellow at uh, the Royal uh, United Services Institute and also uh, recently joined the Atlantic Council as an non-resident senior fellow as well. And uh, Ronald Maynardus, who's the Mediterranean Program Coordinator at LMEP, where I'm also a fellow this year. So with that, I, I would like to start by uh, giving a, a framework for our discussion uh, and how we envisioned it. So the wider geostrategic implications of the war, uh, we are thinking about how it has affected uh, the wider continent of Europe. It has certainly expanded NATO already. Uh, it has focused the resources on NATO's eastern flank. It has acted as a catalyst for a security, economic, and geopolitical reappraisal throughout Europe, and it's near abroad. But I would like to ask our, our esteemed panelists what it specifically means for Europe and its security. Uh, so without further ado, if, if you don't mind, I will uh, start uh, with Mr. Dokos. Thank you. Um, probably, obviously not an easy question. And one of the problems we're faced with is that we don't know how this is going to end. Uh, one has to think um, on the basis of three possible scenarios, victory for Ukraine, uh, defeat of Ukraine, and some kind of stalemate, uh, which is, of course, n not the optimal, the third one, stalemate, not the optimal um, outcome, but perhaps it may allow both sides to uh, portray this as a victory uh, and then uh, move on with negotiations. Uh, one of the big problems is, um, is that going to lead to a Cold War in Europe, a new division um, in the continent? And also what the next day will look like. Um, we need to decide, and of course it's not up to us only, it takes two to tango, uh, what shall we do with Russia? Is it possible to um, come up with a new modus vivendi um, with Putin in power? Or should we uh, have to wait until there is a regime change in, 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 in Russia. And also the, the whole Cold War idea, uh, is that unavoidable? Are there things we can do to avoid that or um, this is beyond uh, our capabilities? Uh, the other problem is that um, we built over decades a very elaborate European security architecture. Um, arms control treaties, confidence building, um, arrangements, uh, that has been collapsing um, for years now, gradually, um, and one can, can blame um, various sides, of course, the, uh, not equally, uh, but the result is that we don't have anything in place. Uh, can we, uh, is it feasible to start rebuilding that once the war is over? Um, no easy answers. Um, Another change is that the uh, European defense um, scene has changed. It has been changing since 2014 uh, with the first Ukraine crisis, uh, but that process has been accelerated. And now we have uh, something unheard of, the European Commission funding uh, defense projects. Uh, we have a number of, inst of, of, of instruments in place. Uh, Europe is doing more uh, for its defense. Not as much as many of us would have liked, uh, and not as quickly, uh, but there is a clear change uh, which should be underlined, and we need to find ways to put the uh, 
the money uh, and the energy into a, a productive use. Um, there's a whole question about Europe and, and its neighborhoods. Uh, the, uh, the, the term Global South has been mentioned several times in, in various uh, panels uh, during those uh, four days in Delphi. Uh, again, no easy answers. Obviously, uh, there is a problem. Uh, we expected, and perhaps we're wrong in, in expecting that uh, a clear majority of, of countries in the world would support us uh, in the case of Ukraine. Um, I think many countries uh, will keep sitting on the fence, uh, making choices a la carte uh, when it suits their interest, and this is something we need to understand and um, adapt our strategies. Uh, and thinking about a new global division, the West versus the rest, autocracies and democracies, I'm not sure this is going to be helpful. Um, my last comment would be, we are still faced with a number of global challenges, starting with climate change, uh, managing emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, AI, but it's not the only one. Uh, stabilizing Africa would be uh, near the top of, of my list. Uh, also, resource competition, energy, um, raw materials, rare earths, and so on and so forth. Um, and the question is, if, uh, inten if systemic competition intensifies um, between uh, you know, the US and, and China and their uh, various allies, um, and if there is no, well, obviously there is no sheriff anymore in the international system. We are well beyond the uh, unipolar moment. Um, it is possible that we may see the emergence or maybe seeing the emergence of a uh, loose bipolar or even multipolar uh, international system. Uh, but my concern is that if there is no cooperation, if there is intense rivalry uh, between the great powers, we may uh, be closer to a, uh, the so-called G0 uh, international system, fragmentation of power, lack of cooperation, and then uh, no one uh, is in charge of leading the efforts uh, for solving those global challenges, and the clock is ticking. And I wonder that what that might mean for Europe. And uh, if I may pass to Ms. Wieslander, and uh, I would like to ask you, Anna, uh, same question. What does it mean? What does the war, how has it changed Europe? And how has the addition of uh, Finland and hopefully soon Sweden in NATO changed the security architecture of Europe too? Thank you so much, Katarina. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Uh, seminar. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, four quick points on how I see the setting uh, and then what the implications are. Uh, you mentioned already uh, NATO and EU enlargement. Uh, that's one obvious uh, thing we have been discussing. Uh, but I would like to add uh, Russia enlargement uh, because uh, Russia, this war has meant that uh, Belarus is now basically incorporated into Russia. And uh, as we all know, they are trying very hard to incorporate uh, Ukraine as well. We are all cautious about Moldova, uh, Georgia. So uh, this is another thing that is happening at the same time. We have what we see as the third uh, trend, the Rus Russia-China alignment. Uh, I wouldn't call it an alliance, there are no commitments, but uh, certainly some kind of alignment when they have expectations to hold each other's back in world politics. Uh, and that is very important how that develops for, for Europe as well. Uh, we have to follow that closely. And the fourth was already mentioned by uh, Mr. Dokos. I think it's the trend towards, uh, we discussed it last evening as well, uh, unipolarity moving away towards perhaps not bipolarity as we expected, but more multipolarity, which means that the world is in bigger transition. And one indication of this would be the surprising reaction of the global south as we see it when they are not uh, aligning with, with, the, with the good forces of the world as we had expected. Uh, 
Um, and this leads me to where, where does this uh, lead Europe and how does Sweden and Finland play into this? Uh, to my mind, I think this is the time when uh, we really need to think about how to avoid escalation and spillover effects because of this very uh, volatile uh, surrounding that we have. Um, and what we have done work on uh, is that to focus on building deterrence uh, as a way of, of uh, taking preventive measures uh, focusing now on solidifying uh, our common ground uh, in order to avoid uh, moving, having moving into defense, because that would be really devastating for us. Um, and therefore, I think the vision that I have is that we should be able to produce one uh, resilient geopolitical flank from the north down to the south, uh, we just did a report on how Sweden and Finland uh, moving into NATO, how what that would do for Northern Europe. But when I looked through it now, uh, coming here to Greece, uh, I think there are a lot of things that we can do together. If we think a bit more broadly on the resilience side, not least, uh, NATO is doing a lot on the defense side, uh, deterrence side. but. Um, imagine um, looking more closely how infrastructure flows actually go through from the north to the south. I was just looking, I know the north better than the south, but I mean, for, for instance, we have, uh, uh, Sweden produces 80% of Europe's iron uh, ore, and it's Sweden and Norway that actually has the main of that. So if we have, you know, um, other producers so other, uh, from other parts of the world uh, taking these kind of flows hostage, Europe will be uh, completely dependent, even to a larger extent, on, on the north, for instance. Norway is now Europe's biggest single gas supply source. Uh, so these are very important flows that need to be going, and, and, and the opposite direction as well. Uh, so I think the EU is doing a lot there uh, that uh, can be uh, multiplied uh, and, uh, no, and uh, also the EU-NATO bridge is very important in this regard to kind of create a more solid resilience pillar of both the EU and NATO for the, best, for the good of, of our continent. Thank you, Ambassador Cohen. Uh, an introductory remark from you, noting also the north-south uh, parameter and how the attention to shifting to the east uh, might actually uh, f uh, help strengthen Europe and its uh, security architecture going forward. Well, let me start with um, a voice of the international community who last week said Russia's invasion of Ukraine in violation of the UN Charter and international law is causing massive suffering and devastation to the country and its people and adding to the global economic dislocation triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Not my words, the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has been a reference point for the international community as a whole, um, and the Secretary General in particular, never seen as siding with great power poles. And yet, the Global South is not responding to that narrative. Uh, let me come back to that. I think there are four main um, impacts that we can see in the geostrategic space of the war in Ukraine already. And I agree with, with um, previous panelists, hard to make a final judgment until we see what the final resolution of this conflict is. But it has certainly reshuffled international priorities. It has exposed and accelerated trends that were already underway in the international system. It has revitalized NATO and it has, um, dimmed Russia's future. Uh, and I, I think as we talk about the impact on Europe, I worked in the OSCE for a while. In the OSCE context, Europe included Russia. I think Russia has now taken a step that has, at least for a generation, decoupled itself from Europe and any European project. Uh, but let me go back through those four impacts. In terms of reshuffling priorities, the priority on hard security and on Ukraine as an issue has displaced the focus of all the issues that, that our first panelist ran through, um, which remain important, but are harder to get to now when you talk to the senior decision makers. Uh, and one of the reasons for the US that Ukraine is so important is because of the potential uh, impact that it has as a precedent for Taiwan. Uh, 
and if you were here for the previous panel, they went through this in, in, in some detail. Um, there are, uh, in, in addition to these reshuffled priorities, I think we're seeing um, risks that are higher than we've seen in decades in uh, Eurasia, in the Middle East, and uh, getting to the point that Katrina made at the beginning, we're seeing the potential for the center of gravity in Europe to shift from the Franco-German jumelage east, um, especially as we see the, uh, the vision that the Baltic states and the Poles in particular had of their neighbors to the east um, seems to be playing out uh, as more true than the vision that the French and the Germans had. What does that mean about leadership in Europe going forward? I'll leave that question for the Europeans to answer, but I think it's certainly a question. Uh, in terms of exposing the accelerating trends that were already ongoing, the multipolarity um, and the hedging activity was already taking place. It was taking place uh, as middle powers started to see that the international system was fragmented and started to build themselves up to respond to that. Um, and analytically, the way I kind of describe this is when the US was the unipolar, unipolar security provider, our expectation was that we would play multi-dimensional chess and all of our clients would play checkers. Now what's happened is they've all decided they're gonna play multi-dimensional chess as well. And what I mean by that is that um, they're playing in multiple directions at multiple times, looking at politics, at security and defense, at economics and at technology, and they can point in different directions on each one of those at the same time. Um, now, if you put all of those pieces together and you, let's just say G20, right? 20 middle powers that are potentially global players and new poles in their own right. As they all try and play multidimensional chess simultaneously, the fragility of the international system increases ge geometrically. Uh, one of the, um, One of the uh, challenges here is what happens to the UN Security Council. And I wanna make a quick reference to China and, and just say that in the UN system, I think the Chinese are quite comfortable where things are uh, because they see an ability to have an outsized influence both in the Security Council and in the UN system as a whole. Um, they have undertaken a, a very uh, considered campaign to fill UN slots across the UN system with Chinese nationals who are influencing the way the UN as a whole works. And they're very happy that that system is moving the way that, that it was going. Now, I would say the UN Security Council is, uh, for lack of a better word, constipated now because the, the Russians and, and the US have such diametrically opposed views of the way forward. Uh, and it was remarkable, I thought, this month to hear the, the Perm rep to the, the U.S. Perm rep to the United Nations say that Russia shouldn't be on that council anymore, um, which raises a question. Now, we've been talking about U.N. Security Council reform for 35 years uh, and haven't gotten very far. But if the position now is that Russia has taken a step that, that violates the U.N. Charter in such a way that it no longer deserves a seat in the view of the United States, where does that take us? And what becomes the new ticket, the new entry point um, for access to that group of global decision makers. Is it economic power projection? Is it, I mean, the, the original constellation was put together by the victors of World War II and nuclear powers. That clearly is no longer the entry ticket. So we need to think hard about uh, where that decision making on the global level goes. In terms of a revitalized NATO, uh, Steve Erlanger wrote a very good piece in the New York Times that I'd refer you to talking about um, how the war in Ukraine has propelled NATO to a, um, a fully formed effort to remake itself again into a capable war fighting alliance uh, after decades of hibernation and self-doubt um, and moving from uh, deterrence by retaliation to deterrence by denial. NATO is now moving from uh, four brigades in the Eastern partners to eight. They are increasing the size of the brigades. The NATO forces are going to be more integrated into US war planning. There's going to be more military spending. Um, and as my former colleague, Will Courtney said, few goals mistakenly scored into a team's own net rival Russia's errors in reviving NATO. Uh, I think we, we see for sure NATO's gonna have two new members, possibly three, depending on what happens with Ukraine. Uh, the, um, 
in terms of Russia and its dimmed future, I think it's clear that Russia is not going to be able to realize its war aims. That was clear already after the first few months of the conflict. Uh, what's really interesting to me is that decoupled from the other European states, and if we call the OSCE, OSCE area, I'd say all, all of the OSCE states except Belarus and possibly some of the Central Asians are on the other side of that divide. Uh, Russia has put itself in the category of one of the two most sanctioned countries in the world together with Iran. Uh, and we'll come back to Iran because I want to talk about the Middle East later on in the panel. Um, but part of Russia's economic stability has rested on its arms sales. Right now, after a year of war in Ukraine, I can tell you that what, what I'm hearing from defense ministries and militaries around the world is that the Russian kit that they were thinking about buying isn't looking so good anymore. Its performance on the field has not been impressive. And Russian defense industry is having to make a uh, prioritized choice now about um, whether or not it's going to uh, fulfill its export, uh, its export commitments or um, resupply its forces in Ukraine. And it, it's almost certainly going to be the latter. Uh, I think we're going to see a significant reduction, especially in sophisticated systems that Russia is able to export. Um, in terms of arms control regimes that was referred to in the European context, but I would take that further. The Russians have pulled out of New START. They um, more or less boycotted the MPT review process. They are absolutely um, agnostic about Iranian nuclear developments now, and their relationship with Iran is particularly worrying. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, and making nuclear threats in the 21st century after where we've been for the last 75 years, I think puts Russia in a, uh, a really sui generis category. Um, so uh, Russia is now being referred to as a tier two player who happens to have nuclear weapons. Uh, I think the West's illusions of partnership with this Russia are over for a generation. Um, President Putin made a speech in October trying to align, you know, basically attacking Western values, which more or less aligned Russia with a kind of Iranian narrative. The, the interesting thing in all of this is that um, the global South, while it may buy the Russian narrative, and I don't think it does, is playing a very cynical hedging game. Um, and not because they sympathize with Russia's war aims, um, but because uh, they want to preserve flexibility and their freedom of choice going forward in those different dimensions. And not necessarily to choose Russia, but to not be constrained into a unipolar world or even a bipolar world, which they bristle against. And uh, I think the main reason for that is they have seen globalization and multipolarity coming for the last 10, 15 years, and they've all designed their state systems to be uh, responsive to a multipolar world, not to be responsive to a unipolar or bipolar world. So if we try and force them into one, and I, I agree that the authoritarian versus democracy paradigm is not helpful in this regard. Uh, they will bristle and they will sit on the fence and they will not make a decision. Uh, let me end by uh, quoting uh, Joe Nye, who was interviewed by Kathy Marini uh, about a week ago, um, who said that the US and the Europeans are considerably, considerably strengthened now. Uh, and that Russia is the net loser in balance of power terms. Thank you. Uh, Ronald, I, if I may turn to you, uh, same question with the added uh, uh, dimension of the uh, yes. Eastern Mediterranean. And um, if you think that uh, there is scope for greater regional integration, including in the Eastern Mediterranean, through uh, trans-regional cooperative ventures, such as the trilateral partnerships. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, I will start with saying that I also have four observations, uh, like Ms. Wiesland and Ambassador Cohen, uh, also considering the time constraints. And, and, and I'm strongly influenced by, by, by what's being discussed in Germany. Uh, as a German national, of course, I follow, I follow the media. And, and then I live in Greece, and of course, there's a different perspective there. And I'll try to somehow combine this. And uh, the first point is, is, is what is obvious here also at this wonderful forum once more time. We see a, a quasi monopolization of the Ukrainian issue. I mean, there are so many panels with this issue and uh, there's not a single panel where the word Ukraine is not mentioned. So, 
certainly in, 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 in the Western part of the world, uh, international relations and foreign relations uh, have become a function of, of, of the war in Ukraine. And uh, 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 this, this radicalism, uh, to put it this way, is particularly evident in my own country, in Germany, uh, where, where we're talking about a, a new age, uh, Zeitenwende, which has become uh, an international term now in all discussions about this. Uh, and I think there's also an agreement that the world has changed, Zeitenwende, uh, as the Greeks would say, we know what we had, but we do not know where we're going to. And this is, I think, the focus of many discussions. And uh, there it depends on where you stand and, and so on. I will not get into this, but what for me is particularly, uh, may I say, worrying, is, is the in-between. Uh, until the new order is established uh, and, uh, and a certain stability may be returning or no stability, we're coming from a certain stability. And uh, uh, one of the highlights for me, at least of this conference, was Francois Hezbois, who was, was referring to the Kindleberger trap and saying that, hey, we are maybe looking at a situation in Europe in the 30s and we know very well what happened in the 40s until we came to the 50s where we had a certain stabilization. Uh, what I want to say is that this uh, quasi-monopolization is, is relatively new. I, I, I like to think back at uh, last year's Delphi Forum, and uh, I was an attendant then of, of the wonderful panel. You presented your report, an Atlantic Council report, about the rising national security threats of climate change. And uh, yes, and uh, I was often quoting Thanos uh, Dokos then because he made a very, very interesting, for me, very, very impressive remark. It says, these are the issues which prevent him from sleeping well at night. Climate change and migration and all these issues which are very close to Greece and Southern Europe. And, 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 and my concern is that, uh, talking about the implications of, uh, of, 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 of Ukraine war, these issues are really put in the back. Uh, we have some tremendous issues there and they're put on the back and uh, they cannot wait. There's a recent German book which is called The Ring of Fire. Europe is surrounded in the south by a ring of fire. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the one point. And the other point is, and, and, and I cannot highlight this enough, I deal a lot with people from the so-called global south. And, 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 and uh, I mean, this is empirically proven in, in, in a recent survey done by the European Council on Foreign Relations that their concerns are different. It's not that they, they approve of what's happening in the Ukraine, but they say, listen, we've had this before and this is for us almost routine. I'm exaggerating now. And they have other concerns. Uh, uh, this was said here, and I quoted this because I thought, I thought this was, was an important statement at this conference. The war in Ukraine looks irrelevant to large amounts of people in the global south, as was said by a French, French, French journalist. It could have been said by an Egyptian journalist or by a Botswana journalist and, or South African. Now, going to the, this is my second point, the situation in Ukraine. We've all, all those people who like reading newspapers and watching television and listening to radio, we've become more or less military experts because there's no day without having updates from the front. Uh, and there the conventional wisdom, at least in, in this part of the world, the narrative is that the Russians aren't doing as they wanted to do uh, and that the Ukrainians are starting their spring offenses. And this at least is the German narrative that this will open the door to some sort of a political arrangement. And there is an often quoted saying that uh, sometimes all wars end. Um, the question is when do they end and how long does it take to get there? And uh, I mean, if we go back in history, we have wars which took 10 years, which took 100 years, which are 30 years and even longer. Um, uh, and if you look at today's world, it's a, it's, 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 it's a kind of stalemate, but it's, 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 it's a truce, but not a peace. I lived for seven years in, in, in South Korea. There is a warlike situation there, and we know the detrimental effect the Korean issue has on the regional stability in the northeast of Asia and beyond. The central questions here are the conditions of a settlement, uh, and uh, there are some clear red lines and we have to point them out, and, and, and this is uh, the NATO relationship to Ukraine and the territorial arrangements. And, and, and I think there's an understanding, at least this is what I gather, is that the Crimea and the NATO membership uh, of Ukraine is something like a red line for Russia, and we hear, as you said, Mr. Ambassador, they're also then threatening with other uh, non-conventional non answers if this should materialize. Um, 
my final two thoughts are very much to where we are here now, and this is Greece and this is the region. Um, uh, one of the takeaways here, and it is, was really brought down in a very, very, I think, very clear way, is that Greece is a winner of what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, of the, this is, we are seeing a, a really dramatic strategic upgrading of Greece. Uh, this is a function of um, explicit and unequivocal commitment of the Athens government uh, uh, towards the West. Uh, if you look into the more recent uh, Greek history, uh, this has not always been as clear as it is now, but it is very, very clear. Uh, and uh, U.S. Ambassador Yunus was, I mean, he was, 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 was like a cheerleader for Greek foreign policy, and we've heard this before. We've even heard stronger statements in this direction from, from American officials. Uh, Greece is celebrated as an energy hub for the eastern part of Europe, as, as a military hub, as replacing uh, Turkish infrastructure, a strategic infrastructure. Uh, and uh, this brings me to my final thought. Um, and I think you mentioned it is, there is, uh, there is this, this um, quest for stability. Uh, and uh, this quest for stability um, and uh, to avoid the spillover. And I see this, and this is very, very uh, important for Greece because as we all know, the main foreign policy concern of Greece is the relationship with her eastern neighbor. We are seeing a new dynamic and a new international consolation uh, for the Greek-Turkish relations. Uh, and uh, there is a great concern. I was just spent a week in, 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 in Berlin discussing these issues with officials there. Uh, there is a big concern that the southern eastern flank of NATO becomes a weak spot, and there is a much effort to, 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 to stabilize this and to do this with uh, diplomatic measures, uh, and uh, what came out for me, the main, one of the main news items of the Delphi conference is uh, that uh, Ambassador Yunis, uh, but also Jens Plötner, uh, who is the Ibrahim Kali of Germany, uh, they were clear in stating that once the elections are over, uh, in Turkey and in Greece, uh, there will be a new dynamism and there will be a new effort uh, from these international players uh, to finally uh, bring a settlement to, uh, to an issue which is weakening the Western alliance. And what for me was also very impressive is that we're not only talking about the classical old Greek-Turkish issues and the Aegean and so on, but Cyprus is moving into, into the equation. I think that's good, for me at least it's good news, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, uh, Mr. Dokos, I think Mr. Maynardus has put, uh, it's not just me asking you this question, it's uh, some of his comments as well. And I'm wondering, do you see a geostrategic upgrade of Greece as a result of the war in Ukraine as part of a nexus uh, moving towards the east and trying to stabilize uh, Europe from the north all the way to the south? And what does this mean for Greek foreign policy? Can I start from the, uh, the big picture and come down to, uh, to, to Greece? Uh, first of all, I think um, what I omitted, uh, I wanted to say in my first intervention, is that there seems to be a new sense of purpose for the West. Um, hopefully something more than just circling the wagons in order to protect the um, uh, rules-based international order. Uh, and to uh, echo uh, the ambassador's comments about the um, global south, uh, each case is different. We even had uh, countries we consider as, as friends and allies um, m maintaining a certain distance, uh, but for different reasons, Israel, India, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates. Um, so it, it will be uh, qu quite a task to manage that afterwards. Um, also, uh, let me reiterate my comment about global challenges and add to my short list uh, also the need to manage the uh, global commons. Um, cyberspace, high seas, the atmosphere space. Um, and, you know, the, the doomsday clock of the, um, uh, that the Bulletin of, of Atomic Scientists has put together, has, has put there for many decades, is now at 90 seconds to midnight. But it's not only uh, or uh, mainly because of Ukraine. The, the clock was near midnight for a long time. So uh, let me emphasize the need to um, manage global challenges. 
also, I, I take your point about uh, the Taiwan president, but it's, uh, well, uh, as a Greek, this is the only, this is not the only possible precedent that comes to mind. Um, um, two um, uh, things on the uh, list of things to do about, on the European uh, level. First of all, the whole idea of European strategic autonomy, um, and th that comes from a strong NATO supporter. I think uh, NATO's preeminence in, in um, European defense uh, cannot be challenged, uh, but there's an obvious need for Europe to do more, uh, and the evolving situation in Sudan underlines that. You know, many of us were hoping that um, the, the EU uh, could come up with a more coordinated uh, response to that crisis instead of its countries sending their own planes and you know, helping each other, but still uh, I'm sure we can do more uh, in such circumstances. And the second point I very much agree about the, the whole hybrid warfare uh, threat to European security and the need to, um, uh, to invest in, in resilience of infrastructure. This is, uh, I think, well understood both at the NATO level and also the EU, uh, hopefully um, will do much more uh, in, in the years to come. Um, finally, uh, Greece. Well, I, I would certainly agree that Greece's geostrategic role has been upgraded over the last couple of years. Um, but I, I would emphasize this should not be interpreted as coming at the expense uh, of any other country like Turkey. I mean, it's time to move beyond the zero-sum game approach. Um, Greece can do a number of things. Uh, Turkey has a different role to play. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to be uh, you know, competitors or, or rivals. Now, I assume that Jens Plettner uh, knows more about the results of the Turkish elections than we do. Uh, and I would like to share his confidence, but uh, let's wait for a few more weeks and see what happens in Turkey. I think um, whatever happens in the Greek elections, uh, the, uh, the will and the interest uh, to move beyond this confrontational relationship is certainly here. Let's see what happens in, in the Turkish elections and hopefully there will be good developments in the months to come. Thank you. Uh, if I may move to Ambassador Cohen, uh, you wanted to speak a bit more about uh, the Middle East, so uh, I think this is as good a time as I need to um, uh, kind of analyze the situation there, and also if you may uh, see where, if you have any comments on where you see the greek turkish relationship in that context, since we're talking about this. Well, first let me comment for a second about the Eastern Med, and, and I would say that uh, Greece, a number of years ago, started to develop these triangles of cooperation with Cyprus and Egypt, with Cyprus and Israel, with Cyprus and Lebanon. These are becoming even more valuable in an increasingly fragmented international system because they provide islands of stability. Um, and uh, you know, kudos to, to Greece for that initiative, and I think the U United States is wise to participate in three plus one. I would like to see the United States participate in the other triangles as well. And it's interesting because a number of the triangle partners are from the global south um, and are closely aligned with, with Greece and Cyprus in those cooperation formats. Uh, I would also say that as a power projector for NATO, Greece has become more important. And Cyprus has become more important, and we saw that with the, the, the symbolic importance of the sanctions package that the Cypriots implemented shouldn't be underestimated. Turning to the Middle East, uh, if you look at Syria, and we're in thinking to the impact of the Ukraine war on these countries, the Russians moved about 300 air defense systems out of Syria. Uh, what that means is you have more Iran, less Russia in Syria. What that means for Israel is that as the Israelis conduct uh, overflight in Syria, they have less ability to have Russian deconfliction from uh, Iranian uh, attack. So for the Israelis, this has changed the picture. For the Iranians, this has changed the picture. And uh, Iran, through its uh, drone cooperation with the Russians, believes that it now has a higher level of deterrent effect uh, against a potential Israeli preemption. 
So the Iranians are feeling emboldened, not only because of that, but also because they got China to broker the final stage of their deal with the Saudis. So they now believe that they have the Russians and the Chinese um, having their backs, uh, which strategically is not good for the West and is not good for Israel. Uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, the Middle East in general was very comfortable with the unipolar world where the US was their security provider for almost all those countries. Uh, they are not comfortable with a bipolar world where they're being forced to choose. Uh, they want to hedge, they want to have their own poles, especially the Emiratis and the Saudis see themselves as poles in their own right. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing the behavior we're seeing. Now that said, a number of them voted with the West in the UN. Uh, and that's important because on a matter of principle, they they support the notion of sovereignty. None, no one wants their bigger neighbor to be able to invade them with impunity. Um, but they don't want to have to choose in the international system. Uh, let's see, the, uh, I, on, on Greece, Turkey, I, I share the national security advisor's view. Let's, let's wait and see how the elections turn out. I, I like to be optimistic, but I'm also pragmatic, and I think we have to see how this shakes out. Um, the, uh, the last thing I'd say is, uh, Going back to China, I think China sees an opportunity, uh, number one, to reduce the risk to its energy security, um, and number two, as China um, and the US have tension, it opens space for other entrepreneurial actors on the world stage. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing these other middle powers asserting themselves. Uh, last thought, um, none of us really have a strategy to address the strategic environment that we see developing. And um, we need to develop one now. Thank you very much. Uh, and if I may turn to you, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Global South, but also uh, I, would, I would argue even in uh, Europe's neighborhood, how, would, how do we address uh, the increasing sphere of influence and the battle for influence in, uh, within Europe sometimes, but certainly close to Europe as well, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from within the European Union to the Western Balkans to the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, do you, do you think there is a, a way to address this and uh, would the greater regional and European integration help in that regard? Uh, I think the fundamental to start with the resilience is, is actually, I mean, we tend to look at the institutions and they can of course be frameworks for discussion and for, for calibrating various perspectives and so on. But then it's actually, uh, the core are our democracies, I think, and to solidify from within. Because if you look at how our societies work, they work a bit, with, a bit differently. Um, we are secular up north, the state is important. Other countries have a, you know, a structure where the religion plays more of a role. Then you have other kinds of authorities as well that could be important in these kind of, if you talk about disinformation and propaganda and so on, and the influence of kind of protecting the core our institutions, our democracies, and our, our people. So I think that's, that's important that sometimes we, I, I'm a, a big friend of, of the EU and NATO getting more involved in all of these issues, but some, we cannot escape the homework that we have to do <laughs> at home uh, when it comes to building resilience. I think that's very important. Um, and then I just wanted to come back to, to Sweden and Finland and NATO, your first question. Because uh, as Finland has joined, Sweden has not. And I think this is also coming back to uh, the fragmentation that these kind of forces that we have discussed can cause. Uh, we have the Vilnius summit coming up, and if Sweden is not ratified uh, by Turkey and Hungary uh, at that time, I really think that NATO will come out as weaker and more fragmented. Uh, because you have 29 allies who already have uh, earmarked or uh, characterized Sweden as a security provider and as a trustworthy ally. Uh, and uh, if Turkey and Hungary abstain from Sweden and Finland making this combined kind of uh, provision to NATO, then I think we will have a big problem. So this is, this is a very urgent issue if we talk about uh, how, how the uh, forces from, from Russia uh, 
I think, directly or indirectly, it plays into the interests of Russia. Thank you, and we'll keep this warning. And Ronald, I'll give you the last word since we're two minutes out. Yes, uh, regarding the, the Sweden issue, um, well, if I gather correctly what I hear from the Secretary General of NATO and what I hear from the, the, the Turkish opposition, which is, is in the running, I mean, they have a chance to win this thing, and then they will settle their Swedish membership in due time. Uh, when I was talking about this, for me, very important new Western interest in solving the Greek-Turkish issues. This is not wish thinking. I'm listening very carefully what's coming out of the mouth of important officials. And uh, the US ambassador said, uh, 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 we will see a very genuine effort to solve the irritants in the relations between Greece and Turkey after the elections. He said this two days ago. I mean, he doesn't make this up and I see Similar wording in, 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 in Germany. I see similar wording in the European Union. I'm just saying this. One last word re regarding Syria. I mean, this is an, an open, uh, open wound just on our borders. And, and there we see that Europe, not to talk about NATO, is not existing. And uh, there might be a shift uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, that, that the Russians are rede re redeploying forces. But the players there are China, Iran, and Turkey. And, uh, and, the and, and, and the U.S. trying to defend what is defendable, but, but the political process, I think, with the normalization of our Arab friends and allies with Mr. Assad, I think is a, is a kick in the face for the Western values and for what everything Western civilization and democracy and human rights and rule of law stands for. And this in our immediate neighborhood, and uh, somehow we have to settle with this. I think Mr. Douglas wants to say something. Just to, to underline another interesting pattern that seems to be emerging uh, over the past few years. We have the traditional institutions, NATO, the EU, but you also have other types of groupings and, and quasi-alliances. First of all, the uh, uh, Shanghai uh, uh, Cooperation Organization, but also the, the Quad, the AUKUS, the I2, uh, U2, uh, Negev, and the trilaterals. Uh, and I, uh, I, I was, uh, have been hoping uh, that perhaps the trilaterals could expand, uh, have all those various trilaterals uh, forming something bigger to cover a, uh, an important region, the, the uh, Eastern Med, Middle East, Gulf region, all the way to India, which seems to be um, not covered by, the, by any institutional arrangement, but at the same time being at the center of interest of a number of important powers. Oh, okay. Um, and and yes, I, I promise to be very, very quick. Very quick. Uh, just because we didn't address this, economic impacts have geostrategic consequences. The war in Ukraine has driven up food and fuel prices in the global south. It's led to um, inflation problems in most of these countries. To correct that, their macroeconomic planners have raised interest rates. This has led to massive economic dislocation. You have supply chain problems. The economic fragility that's been exacerbated by this war can't be reset with the war going on. And dot, dot, dot. Uh, I think we've done a poor job in the West in pointing the spotlight on Russia and saying one man has the power to fix your economy and he's not doing it. Well, with that, I'm going to thank our panelists and you for attending. I think it was a very insightful conversation, so please join me in thinking.